Hello, welcome to another PH video. This video is about ITIL v3 and ITIL v4 part 1. There will be many more videos to this series uh, dealing with each of the books. So this is our normal disclaimer, uh, which I have to present on each video, um, although most of this does not pertain to this material, uh, because this is ITIL, there is no real um, penetration testing or any type of quote-unquote hacking uh, tutorials in this video, but kind of standard for this channel. So with that done, let's get underway. So ITIL was developed back in the early 1980s, and it used to be overseen by the Office of Government Commerce. Then, uh, version one official was 1989 through 1996. It was 42 books long, uh, quite huge. Then version two came out in 2001. It was nine books long, a great improvement. And um, that the version two certification, by the way, was officially retired back in 2009. Version 3 first came out actually in 2007. It was five books, 21 processes, and some functions long. Version 3 2011 edition, as it was called, was the same five books long, but some processes were added, making it 26 processes and functions. Um, back in 2013, ITIL was then licensed by the Office of Government Commerce to Axelos, and then in 2016, uh, in February, ITIL V3 Practitioner Exam was released. This is the um, ITIL V3 um, certification methodology. Um, it started with Foundation, Practitioner, as noted, was introduced back in 2016. Then you had the Capability or Life Cycle models, and then you had Managing Across the Life Cycle, which was an exam by itself. And if you passed all those, you became an ITIL expert. Uh, for full transparency myself, I went the capability track and took Managing Across the Life Cycle and I became an ITIL expert and also an ITIL certified instructor. Now we come to ITIL version 4. Um, first quarter of 2019, ITIL v4 Foundation was released. It still has a lot of uh, basis in ITIL v3, so I wouldn't, don't think of ITIL v4 as a replacement to v3. It's kind of a addendum, a, a updated, some updates and some new features were added. October of this year, we're expecting to see the ITIL v4 Managing Professional Transition Module. This is a temporary exam, which is created to allow people such as myself, ITIL experts, um, to transition into the equivalent role in ITIL version four without having to take all the exams beneath that, um, but um, ironically, um, as an instructor, I have to take all the tests anyway, eventually, um, because ITIL's policy is that you have to have passed the exam to teach the exam. Um, so November 2019, we're expecting to see the uh, ITIL v4 specialist create, deliver, and support uh, test come out, and ITIL v4 strategist direct, plan, and improve come out. Q1 2020, we're expecting to see ITIL 4 Specialist drive stakeholder value and ITIL 4 Specialist high velocity IT. And then Q1 or Q2 of 2020, the ITIL Strategist Leader module uh, should be released. This is the certification structure for ITIL v4 as it is of, of this time. Um, so as noted, this exam here, the Managing Professional MP Transition Test, uh, should be released in October. Um, this is the best information I have at the time of this recording. Obviously, this may change. Um, November of this year, we're supposed to see these two exams come out. And again, um, none of these dates are set in stone, so just going to see. Um, also, for the managing professional, I should note, you'll see in the bottom, it says there, you need to be either an ITIL expert or have 17 credits or more to take the um, exam. Q1 of 2020, we're expecting to see these two exams posted. And then Q1, Q2 2020, this last exam is to be posted. The boxes in blue, the ITIL managing professional and the ITIL strategic leader, are actual titles um, that you achieve 
from taking the test, so they aren't exa exactly exams themselves. I tell master for version four, I'm not sure about yet. I haven't seen documentation on it, but if it's similar to version three, um, I tell master, and I kind of glossed over this because it's, it's more of a very specialized area. It's almost a, you can think of it almost as like a, 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 a dissertation or a master's uh, dissertation light. It's like you have to do like a case study of implementing ITIL and present it to a committee and such. Um, <clears throat> not even an exam. It's more of a more difficult to reach. Um, the value of it is you know you have to make your own decision if that's a worthwhile uh, path to take. Um, for me myself, it was I did not view it as being uh, really fitting my career path. But of course, it's going to be your choice. So what do we know so far about ITIL v4? That's 100%. The core elements of ITIL will remain and continue to derive from the experiences of thousands of specialists. Um, you know, ITIL is a framework. It is not a how-to guide. It is decades of industry professionals contributing to a vast framework to help other industry professionals uh, align business and IT, which is really the heart of ITIL. We do know that version four, and I can tell you after actually reading the entire foundation book and such, there is more DevOps, Agile, and Lean in it. Um, there's also Cloud, so ITIL is trying to adapt with the times. Although being a framework, it's not industry dependent or technology dependent, um, so that adaptation is not doesn't have to be uh, very dramatic, but it is there. Um, your current certification, if you are V3 certified at any level, um, you are not going to leave l lose um, your uh, certification. It still contains tremendous value, and I don't want anyone out there watching this video think, oh my god, I just passed V3 foundation, I feel like I wasted money. I, absolutely not. Uh, V4 builds upon V3. Um, if you guys are interested in becoming a contributor or getting your opinion heard, you can go to this website and sign up, and they would be more than happy to get you on the list. So ITIL exams, and this is where I have to, a little bit of a tangent, is based on what's called Bloom's Taxonomy, which is what you see here. Um, the higher up you go on the pyramid, the harder the exam questions are, um, which is very, which I'll note in a sec. So it really depends on what you the test you're taking. So for example, foundation exams are remembering understanding. This is a very classical type test. Um, it's been a while since I've taken foundation, but it's multiple choice, A, B, C, D. You have a simple question. You have four answers to choose from. Very, very simple. One answer is correct. Three answers are wrong. Um, it's, it's a very binary exam. Either you get the question right or wrong and you move onward. Practitioner is kind of in the middle between intermediate and the advanced tests. Um, practitioner was, it is a scenario-based test, so it's much different from foundation. Uh, fewer questions, but there's a scenario, like an overarching uh, scenario that covers the whole exam. The answers are also short paragraph, few sentences, three sentence, four sentence, which pertain to the scenario. So essentially you read the scenario, then you get the question, which is going to give you more information pertaining to the base scenario, then there will be answers. The difference with practitioner is, again, one answer is correct, three answers are wrong, but what defines wrong and right is much more uh, subtle. So you're not going to read three answers that are absolutely way off and one that is correct. You're going to read four answers, one of them is correct, and three of them yeah, might have been correct. So a lot more difficult. Now once you're an intermediate, at least this was in version three again, the intermediate exams are for version four aren't out yet, but I'm guessing they're gonna keep the same methodology. These are much more difficult. Um, you're gonna encounter, again, I'm referencing V3, uh, five questions, that's it. Um, each question has its own long scenario, usually about a page to half a page long scenario situation. And then the answers are full paragraph answers. So you will encounter five um, you know, four, I'm sorry, I apologize, four answers. I had to check myself there. Uh, four answers. Um, now what makes these tests difficult and why 
you see in the industry many ITIL foundation people, but as you get higher and higher and up the pyramid, the, the numbers drop quite dramatically is because the, they really do use Bloom's taxonomy in the exam for intermediate, which means that one of the answers, one of the four answers is worth five points, one is worth three points, one is worth one point, and one is worth zero points. And the differences between the five and the zero is very subtle. Um, some of the answers, when I took the test, you're literally splitting hairs. I mean, it was you could you could have read all four answers and thought all of them had. They were the, first of all, all the answers you're going to see are based in the ITIL framework. They're not going to give you answers which are are COBIT or Lean or or any other framework. So they're all based on the ITIL framework. They're all correct, but only one of them is the most correct answer to the scenario you read. So for intermediate, I cannot overemphasize, and I will post videos that I tell you for intermediate as they become available. I cannot overemphasize you must, for, for foundation, which I'm gonna to start to give you some pointers in this video and the other videos will go into more detail. Um, vocabulary is like king. You have to learn the vocabulary. I tell vocabulary is, is very, very important. I tell is based on a vocabulary which they defined and if you want to pass the test, you need to memorize their vocabulary, not <clears throat> not COBITS, not CSSP, not ISACA, not anyone else's vocabulary, their vocabulary. An incident is defined, for example, an incident in is defined as an, unexpe an unexpected interruption of service. That's a different definition than other frameworks are going to give you, but for the exam, that's the definition you must memorize and use. Um, in the intermediate tests, understanding not just vocabulary, but the methodology and the concept is very critical. Um, and they do go into a lot of detail. Um, as the tests become published, I will create videos where I go over the syllabus of the tests. And the, and the syllabus, one thing ITIL does, which I give them immense credit for, is they're going to cite the exact chapter and unit within the books that will be on the exam. When they do this, they're not kidding. I've had tests where they will pull out very complex graphics and concepts from the book and put it in the test. And you need to understand it really, really well. The expert exam called Managing Across the Life Cycle is by many considered the hardest exam. It's the same format as intermediate, but they take it the next level of difficult. Um, expert has the highest level of failures because it is a difficult test. Um, the bridge exam to bridge between expert for V3 and V4, I'm quite sure is gonna be an extremely difficult test. Um, and I will definitely post a video just about it as soon as it's published, as soon as I get my hands on more material about it. ITIL Masters, I noted, is kind of above the top of the pyramid because here we're talking about more of a, a analysis case study type paper you're doing. So why should you care about ITIL? And this is a question I've been asked often um, as a contractor, as a teacher. And um, with this, I'd like to reference who uses ITIL, who, who in the industry uses it? Oracle, Nike, Microsoft, Intel, Hewlett Packard, Dell, Sony, Boeing, SAP, IBM, Disney. I mean, lots and lots of different organizations use ITIL, Toyota, ITIL, uh, guys, is a proven industry framework which really works. Here we have some case studies. I'm not really going to go over all of them in detail, but this slide is more of a, if you're in a position where you need to sell ITIL to your organization, you want your uh, department to get ITIL Foundation certified, you need the funding um, to justify the classes to send your, your employees to to get foundation, here's a little snapshot you can pull these statistics up and and give to your manager to get approval for the funding now let's actually look at the itil books this is version three um, itil service strategy was 480 is 483 pages long service design comes in at 442 service transition 347 service operation 370 pages 
Continual service improvement comes in at 246, and practitioner, it's kind of like the odd ducks, 166. So you'll notice the page count actually goes down um, as we go further through. So ITIL version 3 officially was 2,055 pages long. Um, in all honesty, if you're doing ITIL, if you really want to get involved in it, I do recommend you purchase the books. Um, even if you just do foundation, I would purchase all the books and read them cover to cover. They are great reference books. Um, they're very good books to read, and uh, I, I'd recommend it. I think it really helps. For ITIL version 4, we have one book, which is ITIL Foundation, coming in at 212 pages. Um, other books, again, should be forthcoming. Now, Service Strategy, which is the first book, is um, kind of the, the, the starting point, as you can imagine. It's to design, develop, implement your service manage, your, your strategy. And, and Service Strategy really does apply to, like the, the word implies, we're looking at the big picture, the overall large area. The processes you'll, you'll be introduced to here are strategy management for IT services, service portfolio management, financial management for IT services, demand management, and business relationship management. Now, in other videos, um, I will go over each of these books and each of these processes in more detail, but for now, just so you know, these are the five processes in service strategy. Now, after you've established service strategy, you're going to service design. This is the development of the services and processes, um, design principles. We're covering how do we achieve these strategic objectives which we have set, up, set out in the first book. Here we're going to see processes such as design coordination, service catalog management, service level management, availability management, capacity management, IT service continuity management, information security management, and supplier management. And these are the processes for service design. You should memorize, just as heads up guys, these actual processes, just their names, so you know which process applies to which book. That will probably, is usually on the exams. Service transition, you're gonna see transition planning and support, change management, service asset and configuration management, release and deployment management, service validation and testing, change evaluation, evaluation and knowledge management. So this is service transition. So we've gone from service strategy, service design, we've designed the service. Service transition, it's all about moving that service into a live production environment. Service operation, we've now designed, we've implemented, we've transitioned it, and now we're talking about the day-to-day -day running of that service, keeping it running well. We're looking at event management. Incident management, again, as defined by ITIL, an unexpected interruption of service. Request fulfillment management, problem management, and access management. These are the processes for service operation. This is also where you're gonna see the functions of ITIL. Service desk, IT operations management, application management, and technical management. So we have four functions. Now, continual service improvement actually has only one process, the seven step improvement cycle or process. Um, this is actually really important and the reason it's important to touch upon it really fast now is that ITIL is not a, a do once and forget type framework. ITIL is designed around the premise of like the Deming cycle, which is plan, do, check, act, and the cycle keeps turning and turning. Um, some of you have probably seen the picture. It's a, a sideways pyramid. There's a circle with the Deming cycle saying plan, do, check, act, and the wheel is going up the pyramid, and there's a little wedge holding the wheel from falling backwards. That's what continual service improvement is doing. It's, it's, we're talking about you've developed a process, now you have to keep improving it, keep, keep reviewing and analyzing all your processes. This is also, I gotta do a shout out to pixabay.com. They're not funding this video, they're not funding me in any way, but they are this is the website I use for all of my uh, graphics that I don't create myself. A wonderful website, a great team of people who produce some amazing images. You can also upload your own images. Um, I did donate money to them. Um, and you can also give money to the individual uh, contributors, but it's a really cool site. Now we're gonna start gonna get into the, a little bit of the meat and potatoes of ITIL. Um, there was a, a, a saying that a Harvard professor once said, the customer does not buy the drill, they buy the hole it can make for them. 
So the same thing goes with IT guys. People are not buying a cloud solution. You're not buying a server. You're not buying an antivirus. You're buying what that service lets you do. Well, the firewall prevents people from penetrating my network. The cloud solution allows me to access my data no matter where I am, and I don't have to worry about the infrastructure. So this sounds like a very simple concept, but so many organizations lose sight of that little detail. Your customers, internal or external, are not buying a cloud. They're not buying the server room or the data center or any of that. They're buying what it allows them to do. Now here's a little question for you guys. How would you define value? Is value the amount the customer is willing to pay for the service, or is it the cost to provide the service? This is one in a classroom environment I would pause and people answer, but obviously YouTube can't do that. But think about it really. Now it sounds like a very simple question, but which one do you think it is? The correct answer is how much a customer is willing to pay for the service. What it costs you, the customer doesn't care. So value of a service is considered the level of the service that meets the customer expectations. Again, very simple ex statement, but so many organizations overlook this. And the key here is customer expectations. And this is key because you need to control their expectations and also understand what their expectations are. Because only the customer at the end of the day is going to determine the value of the service, not you. You cannot and and some of the things I'm going to say may sound kind of common sense and kind of simple, but believe it or not, I've seen so many countless occasions where the organization or the service provider is trying to say what value is. They're saying this is the value. And I'm always like scratching my head like you can't do that. Only the customer can define the value because they figure out what they're going to do with it. It's to achieve their desired outcomes, not your outcome. They know what they're going to do with the service. You need to understand what the customers want and need and then provide them that service, absolutely. But you cannot, at the end of the day, tell them if they've earned value or not. The other concept that ITIL helps people understand is that today, business functions, IT, IT security, um, really act like when you turn on the faucet in your kitchen, in your bathroom, do you know how that water is getting to your house? Are you aware of the all the pipes and the storage and the cleaning and the sterilization and how they ensure there's no bacteria or lead or bad things in the water? You don't. Today, technology is the same way. It's like a utility. You don't know how the electricity is coming to your house. If it's with solar, wind, hydroelectric, nuclear, coal, you just know you flick your light switch, you get light. You pay your electric bill, you get light. This is how IT today is perceived, and this is that paradigm shift people need to understand. Organizations more and more today do not care what is in your data center. They don't care how much RAM, how many servers, how the RAID is configured, what's your redundancy. They could care less about all of that. They just want to make sure they can access their data, their data can be secure, and that's all they care about. They don't care what your security is. They don't care what kind of firewall you have. They don't care about your firewall rules. All that is moot to them. They view it like a light switch. I turn it on, I get electricity. I go to my network, I can access my files. My files are there that I put yesterday. They haven't left, they haven't been corrupted. That's what, the, that's what they want and that's what ITIL is going to help you achieve. Now there are two factors that define value and this is Really, really important for ITIL guys because this concept is overreaching throughout all of ITIL. In ITIL, value is defined by the utility, fit for purpose or fitness for purpose, and warranty, fit for use or fitness for use. These definitions you must, must understand really, really well. I'm going to go through them a little bit deeper in a few seconds now, but just so you guys know, utility warranty, memorize this if you plan to take the V4 foundation exam. Let's start with utility. Is the functionality offered by the product or service to meet a particular need? The keyword here is functionality. Utility, functionality. What the service does. 
And this you have to answer to yourself. What is the service you provide does? And break it down to the subservices. Because it can meet certain requirements, it is fit for purpose. So for example, a service which improves the ability of the performance of processing sales orders would be considered a utility. It allows you to increase the performance of processing sales orders. That's the utility. Any attribute of a service that removes or reduces the effect of constraints on performance of a task. I know I'm getting a little bit more detailed, but this is actually from the ITIL uh, documentation. You're removing constraints, you're improving performance of what? That's what the service is, fit for purpose. Warranty is the assurance that a product or service will meet the agreed requirements. And here the keyword is assurance, how the service is delivered. Think about this like uptime. How reliable is it? The warranty is availability, capacity, reliability, continuity, security, all of these things. It's fit for use. It is available during the times you need. It can handle the load you give it. It doesn't fail, or it's 99.999% reliable. So a service that increases the speed or availability of a service may be considered a warranty. Any attribute of a service that increases the potential of the business to perform a task. Increases the speed or availability. Now if we go back, because I know some of you are going to wonder about this. If we go back, performance of processing. Notice how I said performance, not speed. And we're reducing constraints. By removing constraints does not always mean I am making it faster. I'm talking about efficiency, performance. This bike is lighter. It's made out of carbon fiber. It can let you bike faster if you want to, but so if you look at a bike, let's say the bike is lighter. It's made out of carbon fiber, for example. I'm reducing the constraints of weight on the bike. But at the end of the day, you still need to use it. It has a potential. You need somebody who can bike as very good physically fit to, to take advantage of it. So it, it can increase the speed or availability is considered a warranty. So warranty refers to any means by which utility is made available to users. Now, you can rewind this as many times as you need, guys, but again, utility and warranty, 100% guarantee this is on this is on the foundation exam. You're going to see this type of question because this is a principle which is really part of the heart of ITIL. Utility is what the service does. Warranty is how it is delivered. If you memorize one thing, just memorize that one line. Utility is what it does. Warranty is how it is delivered. What does a bike do? It lets you move from point A to point B. Warranty is how. What's the frame made out of? How many gears does it have? Is it electric or not? Things like that. So utility, you could say performance supported, constraints removed, or. So it's an or gate. It can be performance supported, constraints removed, either or. Warranty, available enough, capacity enough, continuous enough, secure enough. Notice the and. Fit for use, fit for purpose, which is which. And gives you value. This is where you, know, you have to understand what your, what your customer's needs are. What constraints are they currently facing? And then you can adapt your service to generate value for the customer. And this should go without saying, but utility and warranty should be designed at the same time to save you time and money. Don't do utility and warranty as two separate events. Even though they are separate concepts, they should be designed as much as possible simultaneously. So now let's talk about the most basic concept. And I'm sure a lot of you have your own idea of this. And again, this is an ITIL thing. So a service is a means of delivering value to a customer by facilitating the outcome the customers want to achieve without ownership of specific cost or risk. And this is really important. I'm the customer. 
I view a service as getting some outcome I want, but I don't want to own the infrastructure required. If we go back to the light switch analogy, when you turn on your light switch, you get electricity. What outcome do you want? You want electricity. You want your light to turn on. Do you want to own a nuclear power plant? No. Do you want to own a hydroelectric power plant? No. Wind turbine? No. You don't want the risks that come with that specific, what is needed in the back end of that service. That's what you have to understand. You have to understand what outcomes your customer wants, and then you can figure out if your service meets what they want. Customer satisfaction is crucial. Customers need to not only be satisfied at the current level of the service, but they need to be confident that the service provider has the ability to continue to provide required level of service or even improve upon it. What does this mean? Well, today I turn on my light switch, I have electricity. How confident am I that tomorrow I turn on my light, I have electricity? That's what you need to, was part of what ITIL is going to help you achieve is that confidence level within your customers. Customer expectations are not static, but rather are dynamic and in a constant state of flux. As such, successful service providers must track the customer expectations and meet them or they will soon see themselves losing business. This is the classic downfall of countless organizations in the past. AOL. Give you a great example. Many, many years ago, some of you might remember a company called Blockbuster, Blockbuster Video. They were a video rental store. They offered, they started with VHS, then they went to DVD. Something some people might not know is that the founders of Netflix actually, actually approached Blockbuster. They said, hey, we got a model. We want to mail people DVDs. And the management and CEOs of Blockbuster laughed at the Netflix people. And they said, that is a crazy idea. Nobody will want that. Go away. Well, they went off and, and created Netflix. And you can see today where Blockbusters or Netflix is. The mistake Blockbuster made was they didn't realize that customer expectations were changing. Customers didn't want to drive to the Blockbuster store and look for a movie that may or may not be in stock. They liked the idea that they can just have the DVDs mailed to them. And today, Netflix, obviously, we're now in streaming video. So again, customer expectations have adapted again. No longer do a lot of people want to. Now there's still Redbox and things like that. Absolutely. But a majority of customers now like the streaming video. And this also, you can see, lines up with your internet connection. People want now faster internet. Fiber internet connections, which were once in the realm of research and development only, are now coming into the residential realm. People's expectations are rising. And I guarantee you that fiber, now we're talking gigabit in, in ether, internet through fiber to houses. Probably years from now, it'll be 10 gigabit and 1,000 gigabit. And it'll just keep going up and up as the expectations rise. Well, I want augmented reality capabilities. Well, I want to be able to stream 20 different movies to 20 different screens simultaneously without any lag. Well, I want to power my eight 8K TVs or 16K TVs or 32K, whatever we might have. People's expectations keep rising and it's not static. When you go buy a car today, you expect to see airbags, adaptive cruise control, lane change assist. You expect to see all these features. So we expect things are constantly changing. This is where ITIL is going to help you understand where your customer expectations are now, where your customer expectations are going to be in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years, so you can keep adapting and moving. Service strategy is helpful in, in understanding how this happens and to adapt your service. Now, keep in mind, ITIL is all about constant change. This is the paradigm we live in today. New cell phones come out every year. Things are constantly evolving and changing. Now, let's talk about the types of services as ITIL sees them. The first is called your core services. These are your basic outcomes. Internet. You have internet access. That's a core service. Okay, we offer whatever, five megabit base internet. That's our core service. Enabling services are those services that are in the back end that you don't see. The routers, the switches, the tier one 
routers and switches, what, what, what's in the very base that you don't see. Enhancing services might be, well, we're going to throw an HBO with your internet, or you get a free month of this or that, or you can have faster internet. These are your enhancing services. A service package is when we take a bunch of core services and enhancing services, and we put them all together into a package. Best example is your internet provider. They usually also sell you, hey, we give you internet, we'll give you cable TV, and we give you telephone, we give you voice over IP. This is our package. You can buy all these services together. So two or more services combined offer a specific solution to a specific type of customer or underpin specific business outcome. Well, most people need residential phone, and they need TV, and they need internet. Let's package them all together. It just makes sense. You can have different service packages. Custom now, this is where it gets a little bit more complicated, but customer A might want a utility and warranty of level one. Customer B might want a utility and warranty of level three. And you can decide what defines that. Do all customers need 99.9999, you know, 10 nines after the decimal point uptime of their access to their data? Maybe not. Maybe yes, maybe no. But you would create different service packages for different customers. Now, in ITIL, there are two types of customers. The internal customer, they work for the organization. I know this sounds a little bit confusing, but internal customers are essentially the internal IT department support departments. Who do they support within the organization? That's their internal customers. External customers are not employed by the organization. Separate legal entities. Now, the key here is that ITIL emphasizes you should not be treating internal customers one way and external customers another way. You should be treating your internal customers as nice as you treat your external customers. So don't be rude to your internal and really nice to your external and vice versa, obviously. This is kind of a fun question. This actually can't, you might see a similar question in one of the exams. Can a customer be wrong? Can the user be wrong? The answer is sometimes they can be, sure. The key is, was the value delivered and the sought after service delivered to the customer satisfaction? Remember, value is the perception of the customer. Now, when I say, can the customer be wrong? Can the user be wrong? Sometimes, this does not mean you get to go to the customer and say, ha ha, you were wrong, I was right. That's not the point of this. The point is that maybe they didn't convey to you correctly what service and what value they really needed. They were incorrect, but this isn't a case of, well, this is what you, you, you never want to go to your internal or external customer and say, well, hey, this is exactly what you wanted. I gave it to you. That's not the point of ITIL. The point is understand what the customer's perception of value is. And even if they tell you something and you deliver exactly what they asked for, word for word, perfectly, but they're not happy, your job is to fix it. There is no benefit derive from saying, oh, this is exactly what you wanted, and that's what I gave you. Now I'm leaving. No. Value is derived by you saying, oh, okay, obviously misunderstood. Please tell me what you really need, and I will fix it. Some notes. You can lose a customer, okay, guys, if they don't pay for a service. And always, anytime, I do not care who you work for, um, what your role is in the organization, what level you're at. If somebody asks you to do something illegal, if they ask you to destroy documentation, which you know should not be destroyed, do not do it. Absolutely do not do it. You will, if you are an IT professional, especially if you're an IT security professional, it can destroy your career. I've had many contract roles for, for, for many, many different organizations. And I've had, I've gotten roles because I'm that person I say, wow, he does not break the rules. He will not destroy data or anything, you know, even if somebody asks him to do so. You need to be ready and able to stand up 
to your supervisor, to an executive if they want you to do something which you know is illegal. If you are unsure about if something should be done, if you are questioning the legality of it, get it in writing as an email. Don't just do it. Don't take their word for it. Tell them, can you please email me exactly what you want me to do? If there's no legal, legal issues with it, that person should easily email you and they should be your superior. So at least you have, and I hate to say this, but this is the reality, you cover your own butt. And that is really critical, guys. Always make sure you get it in writing, ideally in an email. Use delivery confirmation, things like that. So just be careful. Don't, don't be that person who gets held responsible for someone else's bad actions. Internal service, we're supporting internal activity. External service, obviously, we're achieving business outcomes. You have to understand how your organization's internal and external services come together. Important to recognize that internal service is linked to an external service. So you need to really understand, ideally, if you have process mapping, you understand how these come together. This is really important when you have to answer that question return on investment. I want to invest a million dollars in X. Well, when you're putting together a business case, and we'll go over what business cases are later on, this link between the internal service and external service is really, really important. Let's look at a little bit more detail. Step one, you want to define the outcomes. I know this sounds like putting the, the carriage in front of the horse, but this is really important. You want to define your outcomes. Then you want to figure out which IT services support that outcome we want. And then how are the IT services will be aligned with the other chain dependencies within the organization? So again, this is where process mapping, really understanding what feeds what within your organization is really going to help you out. It's going to help you optimize and improve this, the, the functionality of your organization. Service management. This is a little bit of the vocab part of the test. A set of specialized organizational capabilities for providing value to customers in the form of a service. Capability. Definition again, this is from service design. The ability of an organization, person, process, application, IT service, or other configuration item to carry out an activity. Capabilities are assets of an organization. Capabilities represent an organization's ability to coordinate control and deploy resources to produce value. There's another keyword in here called configuration item. We're going to go over what those are a bit later, but this is an example of the vocabulary you need to memorize. And again, guys, you're taking an ITIL exam. This is the definitions they're looking for. Not your definition, not what your boss told you, not what this other framework told you, not what COBIT told you, not what, not what, what, what ISC squared and your CSSP told you. This is ITIL's definition. Now on the test, they do sometimes put other frameworks, definitions for capability, for service management, for other concepts, because they want to trip you up. The other reason ITIL is so rigid on its vocabulary is because if you are talking to a fellow ITIL certified professional, you both know you're going to be on the same page as you're discussing that vocabulary. And that is really, really important. Capabilities are shaped by challenges that your organization is expected to overcome. In my classes, I often reference this sighting of Toyota. In the 1950s, and some people might not even remember this, in the 1950s, Toyota cars were junk. I mean, they were really, really bad cars. Toyota was viewed as like this junky, cheap Japanese trash can on wheels. Well, back then, Toyota quickly realized that they didn't have the money. They didn't have 
the resources. They didn't even have the capabilities that the big automakers like GM, Ford, Chrysler had. They had developed their capabilities. Today, Toyota makes some of the best cars on the road today. Lexus is a division of Toyota. So they were challenged and they improved their capabilities to overcome those challenges. That's what ITIL is going to help you do. Um, there will be separate videos later on about something called Kazan Kan Kanban, which is a great methodology to help and it aligns very well with ITIL. But that's for a separate video, but you can look that up if you're interested. So, IT, you have to understand, is a collection of systems. An organization has its own set of capabilities and resources. Now, the part that get here, IT costs are treated like business expenses. Um, this is a plus and a minus. Most people Organizations view IT and IT security just as an expense, a cost center. But you want to do this paradigm shift, and IT will help you do that to help them see that IT costs are really investments. It's not an expense. IT is not just money going out the door. But it's actually helping support the business. This comes back to understanding how to align your internal services with your external services. That'll help better generate and help you with business cases and show how, wow, this investment IT is really generating money. Every, I like this one, every IT organization should act as a service provider, which means you should be constantly trying to improve, understand what your internal customers' needs are, your external customer needs are, and I always say to people, listen to your customers. Um, Personal philosophy, personal process is after every project I complete, I've worked on, I like to get feedback, send out little surveys to the departments that you worked with. What do you think of the project? How did things go? How is this new service working? What do you like? What don't you like? A lessons learned. And this should always be done. You should always, you know, check your ego at the door be humble and listen and i cannot overemphasize this. i've seen so many it professionals fall flat on their face because they don't listen i have a ton of initials after my name but when i send emails in an organization i don't put any of my initials after my name. i just put my name because i believe humility and listening to people is how you grow and become a better an it professional how i have risen through my career it's not been by me saying, hey, I've got all these initials after my name. I do it by my actions and listening and, and getting that feedback and doing the lessons learned. And nothing is more powerful than that. And ITIL is going to help you do that. It's going to help you learn to really listen to other people, really listen to your, your internal and external customers and grow your department. Service level agreement. There's, again, another example of a definition you need to know. SLA. And again, guys, I don't care how your organization defines SLA. And if you're going to pass an ITIL test, you should not care. This is the definition you need to know. An agreement between an IT service provider and a customer. An SLA describes the IT service, document service, legal targets, level, sorry, level targets, service level targets, and specifies the responsibilities of the IT service provider and the customer. A single agreement may cover multiple IT services or multiple customers. OLA, organizational level agreement, we'll talk about that in a sec. So SLA, it's an agreement. It describes the level of service targets and the responsibilities. OLA, operational level agreement. An agreement between an IT service provider and another part of the same organization. Many organizations I've seen take SLA, this one here, and they apply to their internal customers. According to ITIL, this is incorrect. Okay, once again, I don't care what your organization does, this is what ITIL does. You want to pass a test, you memorize these definitions. An agreement between an IT service provider and another part of the same organization. 
It supports the IT service provider's delivery of IT services to customers and defines the goods and services to be provided and the responsibilities of both parties. For example, there could be an OLA between the IT service provider and a procurement department to obtain hardware in the agreed amount of time between the service desk and the support group to provide internal resolution agreed times. So operational level agreements are the supporting services inside the organization. SLAs between you and an external customer. These are the definitions you have to memorize, guys. What is a process according to ITIL? A structured set of activities designed to accomplish a specific objective. A process takes one or more defined inputs and turns them into defined outputs. This is really important, guys. It's defined outputs and defined inputs. It may include any of the roles, responsibilities, tools, and management controls required to reliably deliver the outputs. A process may define policies, standards, guidelines, activities, and work instructions as needed. What is a function? A team, a group of people and tools and other resources that are used to carry out one or more processes or activities. Service desk is a function according to ITIL. A function in ITIL has two other meanings, making it a little bit more complicated. A intended purpose for a CI, configuration item, person, team, process, or IT service. For example, one function of an email service may be to store and forward outgoing emails, while the function of a business process may be to dispatch goods to customers. To perform the intended purpose correctly, as in the computer is functioning correctly. So a function could be people carrying out a process. Function continued, a group, number of people, a team, more formal type of group, department and division. These are just a little bit of, of vocabulary. Again, for the exam guys, you have to memorize these definitions. There is ITIL, especially when you get into the intermediate exams, there is zero gray area when it comes to these definitions. Um, they are really, really strict on this stuff. And here are the four functions within ITIL. Service desk, single point of contact, and this is really important, guys. Um, we're gonna talk about the different types of service desk, like follow the sun and stuff like that. But the key word here is single point of contact people can reach out to if there is a service disruption. Single point. So if a question says, hey, service desk can be, you can have multiple points of contact, that's incorrect. Single point of contact. What does that mean? It means you're calling one 800 number. You're going to one specific website to file a incident has occurred, a service desk request. Technical management provides detailed technical skills and resources needed to support the ongoing operation of IT services and the management of IT infrastructure. That's it. Memorize these definitions. IT operations management. Execute the daily operational activities needed to manage IT and support the IT infrastructure. Again, daily. IT operations management. Remember service operation? This is the day-to-day -day functioning. Daily operational activities. Applications management. Managing applications throughout the life cycle. Now, I know this may seem really, really boring and redundant, me sitting here reading you off definitions, but I promise you that every foundation level class I've ever taught, I've always supplemented this slide deck and people have always come back to me and said, wow, that allowed me to pass a test. They always came back to me and said, wow, during the class, I was like, why is he drilling these definitions in our head? And then they took the test, they walked out of the test, they said, oh, that's why. Because Foundation Guys is really, really heavy on vocab. And I've had people take the test, say, oh, I don't even know the vocab, I'm fine. I've been doing this 20 years, I know IT. 
and they walk out and fail. And they go, what happened? And then they follow the vocab strategy I'm giving you right here, and they pass the test with flying colors. Guys, I'm coming to you as someone who's been teaching ITIL for many, many years, passed all the tests myself. So I've gone through this myself. I'm not teaching you something I have not gone through myself. So really, really helpful. A policy. Formally documented management expectations and intentions. Policies are used to direct decisions and ensure consistent and appropriate development and implementation of processes, standards, roles, and activities. What are standards? A mandatory requirement. Examples include, in this case, ISO 20000, international standard, and internal security standard for Unix configuration, or a government standard for how financial records should be maintained. The term is also used to refer to code of practice or specification published by a standard organization such as ISO or BSI. What are guidelines? A document described best practices, recommends what should be done. Again, recommends. Compliance with a guideline is not normally enforced as a standard. So with a standard, go back to this one, mandatory requirement. So think standard, mandatory requirement. Guideline is a recommendation. Well, we recommend you do this. A speed limit on the road is a guideline. We recommend you do this speed limit. Now you could argue it's also a standard because if you go faster than the speed limit, you'll get a ticket. The problem with that is that if the speed limit's 30 and you're doing 35, chances are you're not gonna get a ticket. If, if the speed limit's 30 and you're doing 80, you're gonna get a ticket. Roles, a set of responsibilities, activities, and authorities assigned to a person or team. A role is defined in a process or function. One person or team may have multiple roles. Very important. For example, the roles of configuration manager and change manager may be carried out by one person. Role is also used to describe the purpose of something or what it is used for. This again is very important. It can be one person, it can be a team, and multiple roles can be put together. A configuration manager and a change manager can be the same thing, you know, and assuming this is we want separation of duties, obviously, which we'll discuss in other videos, but just know that roles can be combined. What's an activity? A set of actions designed to achieve a particular result. Again, particular result. Activity is usually defined as part of the process or plans and are described in documented procedures. An activity is not a process, but it's part of a process. What's a procedure? A document containing steps to specify how to achieve an activity. Procedures are defined as a part of a process. Work instruction, how to bake brownies, how to configure server X. What's a work instruction? A document containing detailed instructions that specify exactly what steps to follow to carry out an activity. A work instruction contains much more detail than a procedure and is only created if very detailed instructions are needed. Again, guys, memorize these definitions. Let's look at a process in a little bit more detail. So a process defines actions dependencies and sequences as well. A well-defined process can also improve productivity within the organization <coughs> and within functions. Processes should always be measurable. If you can't measure it, it's not a good process. Again, we should have a specific result. <coughs> Excuse me. Who is the process for? Who are the customers? Who are the stakeholders? And what triggered the process to start? And, it, and this is very important at the bottom here, traceable to a specific trigger event. 
all processes must have a specific trigger event. If you have processes in your organization that do not meet all four criteria noted here, I would highly recommend you revisit that process and find out why or how you can fix that. So here's kind of a graphic of a process. We have activities, procedures, metrics, work instructions, roles, and improvements. Something triggered the process, and then the process takes an in inputs. The process then has a specific output. The output, though, gives us feedback, documentation, reports, and reviews. This is where our policy comes into play. And the process is fed by resources and capabilities to keep the process running. Okay, some closing notes. So a process is organized around a set of objectives. Main outputs should be driven by the above mentioned objectives. Why does the process exist? Why do you do it? Processes should conform to operational norms and a process should be considered effective only if it's repeatable, it's measurable, it's managed, it achieves the required outcomes and efficient if it's using minimum resources. One quick closing note about processes, um, which I'll cover more in, in future slides, but I want to bring in to point here is that whenever you're looking at process improvement, a lot of people go with the quote unquote low hanging fruit, the easiest thing to fix. I would say this is not a good thing to do. And the example is pretty simple. With processes, what you want to look for is what's called the bottleneck. What process, either process or processes or thing within the process, is slowing things down the most. This is where you should make your first efficiency um, update. And the reason is as follows. Let's say we have a bottleneck. So imagine like a, I really should, I will redo this in other videos further, but if you fix what's before the bottleneck, are you going to make, is the output of that process going to get any better? No, because the bottleneck is still there. If you fix what's on after the bottleneck, are you going to fix anything? No, because the output is still being controlled by that bottleneck. So if you fix things before or after, it's not going to have a significant result. You have to fix things, you have to fix the bottleneck first, and then the output will be fixed. That's very important to understand. Okay, if you like this video, please like and share, subscribe, push the notification bell. More videos are coming. Um, I do apologize for the sporadic posting of videos. Um, a lot of work goes into these. These ITIL videos, actually, I kind of popped off doing some CIS videos and popped into these because I realized, wow, I've got a whole bunch of ITIL decks um, from years of teaching, and I can get these reformatted and, and thrown on YouTube and get get some get you guys some good uh, videos that have had good good. PowerPoint decks, good presentation, I've had good feedback over the years, so I figured, what the heck, let's get it out there. So again, thank you very much, and I hope everyone has a great day.